This video is brought to you by Keeps. What's up guys, Michael here to talk about the main cause of carpal tunnel syndrome in 35 and unders, swiping on dating apps. If you're looking for love online, chances are you've racked up a fair share of heartbreak or at least mild disappointment. While offering a seemingly infinite supply of potential suitors, dating apps can feel like an endless cycle of swiping, forced witty banter, awkward coffee dates, mutual ghosting, and ultimately going to bed alone. So how did we get here? Is online dating a unique techno-sexual dystopia or the natural culmination of centuries of courtship rituals? Let's find out in this wisecrack edition, online dating, is love just a commodity? But before we dive in, I want to tell you about this week's sponsor, Keeps. Keeps makes it easier for guys to prevent hair loss. With their affordable prescription service, you can maintain the hair you have with convenient at-home treatments. The process begins with a free consultation with a licensed Keeps doctor who can recommend a combination of FDA-approved prescriptions and over-the-counter medications that's right for you. These hair loss prevention medications will land at your door every three months, so you don't have to dedicate any brain space to remembering refills. As your treatment plan goes on, you can message your Keeps doctor 24-7 to update them on your progress and ask any questions you may have. It typically takes between four and six months to start seeing results, so get started today to hang on to the hair you have. Go to Keeps.com slash Wisecrack or click the link in the description to receive 50% off your first order. That's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash Wisecrack. Now, back to the show. To contextualize the modern dating scene, let's look to history. For much of dating history, heterosexual courtship was all about getting a ring on that finger. Most women weren't allowed to work and thus sought financial stability via marriage, while men were incentivized by that sweet, sweet dowry. What's wrong with her? She's beautiful, she's rich, she's got huge... Tracks of land. Courtship was largely a private enterprise arranged between families, with women essentially functioning as bartering tools to solidify social alliances. Potential candidates were evaluated based on class and social status. Sociologist Ava Ilus also notes that most young people were pressured to accept their first reasonable option. Love was nice if it happened, but this was mostly a regimented transaction. Not all of us can afford to be romantic. I've been offered a comfortable home and protection. There's a lot to be thankful for. Charlotte. I'm 27 years old. I've no money and no prospects. But then, in 1840, Queen Victoria and legendary wife guy Prince Albert entered the chat. For me, this is not a marriage of convenience. No. I think it will be a marriage of inconvenience. They were famously head over heels in love a romance that only got more legendary when Victoria publicly mourned Albert for 40 years after his death. Royals, as you may know, were basically the original influencers. So this romance, coupled with the mainstreaming of Enlightenment ideals about personal fulfillment, helped make marrying for romantic love start to seem important and even noble. For upper-class women, this era of courtship meant suitors leaving calling cards and arranging chaperoned meetings. Like Bumble, but your frowning stepmom is also there, just just sitting and, and judging. What's important is that courtship now entailed assessing compatibility between families, personalities, and so on, rather than just settling for the first Joe Schmo who threw a stone at your window. Working class women, somewhat empowered by the wage economy, were less bound by ceremony, and often lived in apartments too small for men to come calling anyway. They met men on their way to work, in shops, or at music halls. They dated, had sex, juggled a bevy of admirers, and it wasn't uncommon to be pregnant on your wedding day. Dating around wasn't just a fun time. It was also considered essential to finding the right match in what Ilus calls the emergence of a self-regulated market of encounters. But here's the thing. In the dating culture that emerged at the end of the 19th century, money became even more central to the direct interactions of the couple. Because now, dating meant going on dates, and going on dates tends to cost money. A scholar Beth L. Bailey explains, courtship was largely construed and understood in models and metaphors of modern industrial capitalism. 
As dates moved from living rooms into dance halls and bars, money was what Bailey calls a symbolic currency of exchange, where men needed to pay to gain access to women's company. By the 1920s, she notes, dating provided a new frontier for public competition through consumption. As a result, young people started defining themselves as commodities. Men by how much they could afford to spend on theater tickets, women by how much they were worth spending on. This fittingly coincided with the explosive growth of the consumer economy, which transformed ideals of romantic love. If men now needed to have money to burn on vaudeville shows, women now needed to look like pre-war Kardashians. That's in large part due to the increased sexualization of women in the media and advertising. Industries like cosmetics relied on enticing imagery to create demand for new products. As Ilus notes, before the 1920s, the word sexy was actually considered derogatory. It was more preferable to shack up with someone who was, say, super moral or reliable. But as mass media began pumping out images of eroticized female bodies, and soon enough, male bodies, sexual attraction began figuring into people's choices in a much bigger way. As marital selection became increasingly less based on your social status and more on subjective things like sex appeal, the ability to land a regulation hottie started factoring more into people's conceptions of individual self-worth. As Ilus puts it, under modernity, sexuality thus becomes closely intertwined with social value. But of course, nothing spoils the sex party quite like a pair of world wars. Couples were split apart, with courtship relegated out of the dance hall and back to the post office. But it went beyond these basic logistics. The idea of a chaste woman who stayed home loyally awaiting the troops' return became hugely popular, especially during World War I. And that chaste woman became something of a commodified trophy for men down in the trenches to fantasize and sing about. My girl back home, I'd almost forgot a blue-eyed kid, I liked her a lot. While the fellas were away, working class and middle class women also spent more time in the public sphere, doing man stuff like going to job and sometimes wearing trousers. But especially after World War II, the return of the troops, plus rising pressure to marry early, pushed a lot of women back into the home. Some of the rush to get married was out of anxiety about the scarcity of eligible men post-war, which reinforces a marketplace vibe. But this also had other important economic implications. Whereas married women had once been treated like pure commodities, housewives were now the main consumers of commodities. Men went to work, produced goods, accumulated capital, and their wives spent that money buying more goods. Thus, the marriage industrial complex became vital to keeping the consumption-driven 1950s economy humming. Meanwhile, for the burgeoning youth consumer culture of the 1950s, going steady became a coming-of-age dating ritual in its own right, complete with varsity pins and a sexy game called Two Straws, One Milkshake. Did they really get pins? Going steady! I was hoping they would! Going steady! By the mid-1950s, one in ten middle school students would go steady at least once before turning 11. Of course, I better than doubled those stats myself. Going steady is essentially the origin for how we conceive of dating today, in all its serial monogamy. And make no mistake, just as it was for their parents, consumption was inextricable from this boom in young love. Shopping and investment became metaphors for dating. You needed a car to neck in, a class ring to exchange, a letterman jacket to drape over your date's shoulders, records to dance to, and turntables to play them on, meals at the malt shop, and so on. And dating remains a consumption-driven activity to this day, even if we've swapped banana splits for charcuterie boards and class rings for Netflix passwords. Now, the 1960s and 70s, as you probably know, brought varying degrees of free love and rebellion against the previous decade's sexual and romantic constraints. But by the 1980s, we saw a return to conservative values in pretty much every element of American society. It's around this time that the 1950s were reimagined as a nostalgic utopia of happy families born from people who'd just lost their virginity. The free market obsessed 80s also saw the ascendancy of dating technology, like computer-based dating services, or the truly heinous video dating boom. Hi, I'm Maurice. I'm an executive by day and a wild man by night. These companies promised to help you, say, do comparison shopping of potential dates from the comfort and privacy of your own home. Again, 
we see the language of capitalism continuing to permeate dating. And then came the internet. Now, technically the earliest version of computerized dating came from Harvard in 1965, when some students created Operation Match a half century before your favorite sunscreen enthusiast would start your least favorite social networking site in hopes of getting laid. This 75 question long survey helped tens of thousands of people learn about well-suited potential new mates in its first year alone. And its algorithmic match process has since been emulated by modern dating sites. These companies also used the knowledge gained from those questionnaires to mine consumer data, a practice that would only grow in the years to come. As the internet entered more homes, companies like AOL funneled people into chat rooms, bulletin boards, and so on based on mutual interests, which inevitably led to dating. The first dating site, Kiss.com, launched in 1994, followed shortly thereafter by Match.com in 1995. And by 1998, Nora Ephron made the world a better place with the film You've Got Mail. Side note, we actually made a video about how that delightful film is secretly fascist, so check it out. Now, early online daters encountered plenty of stigma and were often painted as desperate. But the more online our lives have gotten, the more mainstream online dating has become. By 2007, Americans alone spent $500 million on online dating services, making it the second most profitable sector of the internet economy. And, and we all know what the, the highest industry is, the one, the one you have to open up the anonymous browser to go look at so it's not in your history so that if your mom uses your computer, that thing doesn't happen again like it did that one time. So it comes as no surprise that online dating services are expected to rake in over $3 billion this year in the United States alone, especially in light of how a cornucopia of new dating sites and apps have cropped up, boasting new innovations like Tinder's gamified swiping interface or Bumble's woman-led dating model. A benefit of online dating is the way it creates opportunities for people from specific communities to connect with each other. LGBTQ plus folks, people in rural areas, elderly or disabled people, hell, even fly fishermen. It can also be a relatively unthreatening way to meet new people and sometimes to screen out potentially bad matches. But we see something else going on that we think does a lot to explain why online dating can feel so hard and occasionally pretty depressing. Now, we've talked about the intersection between dating and economics, from dowries to theater dates to the consumer demand for engagement rings that cost a month's salary. But we'd argue that online dating basically takes the commodification of the actual act of dating that cropped up around the turn of the century and turned it up to 11. Put it up to 11. 11, exactly. How? Well, as scholars Rebecca D. Hino, Nicole B. Ellison, and Jennifer L. Gibbs note in their article, Relation Shopping, dating sites are typically designed like online shopping platforms, evoking the sensation of literally window shopping for a match. They write that the functionality and design of online dating sites encouraged participants to adopt a marketplace orientation towards the online dating experience. Now, that doesn't necessarily make Tinder sinister, but it could have real implications for the kinds of relationships you're most likely to find. In Relation Shopping, the authors write that online dating may encourage an attitude where prospective partners are commodified as products to be sold, assessed, purchased, or discarded. Being discarded is probably fine if you were only looking for a one-time hookup, but it lends a depressing air if you're in search of a long-term relationship. Elus notes that it also leads to hypercritical assessments that render potential partners commensurable, measurable, and comparable with each other. And if sexual attractiveness became a big deal in the 20s, it's only been magnified in importance. Because these apps facilitate a lightning fast, superficial decision making process, typically based on a few flattering photos. Online dating also massively expands your pool of potential matches, creating a sense of interchangeability. How many Daniels can you match with before they all blend into the same guy in cargo shorts? And this replicates the overall sensation we have as consumers today, where we're similarly empowered to choose between a dizzying array of 125 toothpaste brands. What's more, in the logic of online dating, potential matches are reduced and scrutinized by isolated attributes, making them easier to reject or discard. Research has found that the ease of discarding online dating partners may even continue into a relationship, 
That's partly because of the lack of an integrated social environment, i.e. shared friends or communities, which makes it feel easier to ghost. Overall, Illuz argues, internet dating sites display the consumerist logic of increasingly narrowing, defining, and refining taste, and comparing among alternative possibilities. While it's obviously good to be picky when it comes to choosing a long-term partner, applying consumerist logic to actual human beings seems less picky, more icky. And it's not just your potential dates that are being commodified here. The authors of Relation Shopping also note that online dating encourages self-commodification via a tangible and explicit assessment of one's own perceived desirability in ways less likely to occur with traditional face-to-face -face communication. That is to say, participants in online dating are constantly receiving reams of data that cause them to assess their own objective value in the dating world, which can feel pretty harsh. So what does this all say about us? Well, modernity, Illuz explains, has been all about the rise of the rational in just about every aspect of life, from psychology to weight loss fads. Online dating reflects the rationalization of love, where we're encouraged to assess potential dates as laundry list of attributes rather than messy, complex human beings. The endless supply of consumer choices that defines late capitalism has been effectively mapped onto human relationships. While some of us may romanticize the 1950s model of going steady long term, the tech we're using to find relationships may be counterproductive in achieving that goal. Think about it. After World War II, women settled into marriage quickly due to the scarcity of eligible men. In contrast, the seeming abundance of matches provided by online dating might incline us to not settle down at all or to discard a potential mate simply because there might be a shinier object just a click away. Don't get us wrong, exploring your options is great, but when it's treated like the same process as finding the right Netflix show, it starts to feel a little cynical. And the commodification of human beings on dating sites goes even deeper. Hinge might brand itself as the dating app designed to be deleted, but it's actually in all the app's best interest to keep you scrolling through face after face. And their casino style interfaces make it all too easy to waste an evening doing just that. Ultimately, these companies make a great deal of money by collecting super valuable data about some of the most intimate aspects of your life. After all, these aren't old friends interested in helping you find love, they're tech platforms interested in earning a buck or a billion of them. So it seems that dating has become more complicated and more commodified than ever before. Finding a mate, a prospect once simply determined by your family's financial capital, is now an important means of affirming your worth, of broadcasting your individual social and or cultural capital. Qualities like your sense of humor or your great hair, Illu says, they'll start to become indexes of your inner value. In other words, if you used to be able to blame your bankrupt dad for hurting your chances of landing a wife, now you're implicitly told to blame yourself for not being witty enough in your about me section. So what are we supposed to do? We're years off from designing our perfect partner in a lab, free love communes are harder and harder to find, and sex robots can be hacked and turned into murder bots. So are we stuck as self-aware commodities in an ever-expanding marketplace of increasingly disposable romantic products? Well, barring some kind of cultural backlash, online dating will probably keep becoming increasingly intrinsic to our courtship rituals. We can't change that. But maybe recognizing the unusual historical moment of dating that we're in can help us be a little less hard on ourselves when the process feels hopeless. And maybe thinking about how weird it is to treat yourself like a commodity can help us be a little less judgmental towards men who post photos of themselves with tigers. Because at the end of the day, we're all looking for some iteration of the same thing. Human connection, whether for a night or forever. Well, that and romantic partners who look like they're auditioning for a Tiger King biopic. But what do you guys think? Do you wish your romantic life was still determined by dowries? Is online dating killing romance? Or is shopping for dates fun and empowering? Let us know in the comments. Big thanks to our patrons for all your support, and be sure to check out our podcast. Hit that subscribe button like it's a super like on Tinder, and don't forget to ring that bell. And as always, thanks for watching. Later. Shout out to all my soldiers online dating actively. It sounds rough.
Bring back arranged marriage. Okay, here we go. 